if you're married, worth investing in. And if you don't invest in it, it's going to cost you. Man. Praise God. Everybody said praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Acts chapter 2, verse number 1. Amen. Acts chapter 2, verse number 1. The Bible is divided in two major sections. Testaments, it's called. A testament is, in this case, a will that God has left for us. There's an Old Testament and a New Testament, and the New Testament fulfills the Old Testament. It does not do away with it. In the Old Testament, there are 39 books. In the New Testament, there are 27. In those 27, there are four divisions. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the Gospels. The book of Acts are the actions of the church when it was first born. Then from Romans to Jude are letters written to the church telling them how to live and worship. And the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ given to John on the Isle of Patmos. So we're reading in one of the divisions. This book is a division by itself, and that's the book of Acts. And uh, the church was born here, and it continues on today and it is the uh, main focus of God from beginning to end so he calls the church his bride and that's the most important thing to God amen so when the day of Pentecost was fully come Pentecost is a feast day 50 days after the Passover of the Old Testament and Jesus was crucified on the Passover so this is uh, this is 50 days later 50 days later from the time that Jesus was crucified when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were all in one accord in one place and there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and it filled the, all the house where they were sitting, there appeared unto them clothed in tongues like as of a fire, and it set on each of them. And they were all, everybody say all, all. filled, everybody say filled. filled. It's not just a sprinkle, it's not just a dip your finger in it. This is a filling with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for your promises and your miracles and your plans for us. We, us, we give you praise for it today in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I do want you to pay attention in service tonight. But I would also say that perhaps a little bit later we will have some questions and answers. Hopefully we have answers. Amen. The Bible's got the answer. Uh, so if there is something that you would like to hear talked about or uh, pose as a question, we would entertain that here in a little bit. But I'm starting out tonight with God's plan for you. God's plan for you. And uh, many people don't have a plan for themselves. And uh, it's good to have a plan. It's good to have a goal. And when I was in the first grade, they were telling me that. And so they went down the line, and the girls wanted to be either nurses or teachers. And the boys wanted to be firemen, doctors, or a lawyer. And... Uh, and so, you know, they want you to start thinking about what you're going to do in life. And, of course, when you're six, you have no clue, really. Uh, but it doesn't hurt to think about it. And then as you grow in life and you find some hard trials and you 
decide whether you like school or not, decide whether you like math or history or English or whatever, whatever your propensity is. You begin to formulate a plan for your life, maybe in the back of your mind, maybe somebody suggested it. Uh, and school and teachers help a lot in this area. But God's got a plan for you. And when I say you, I'm talking about every last person in the building, along with every last person in the world. And uh, at the time of Jesus Christ, there were 280 million, which is a little bit less than the population of the United States of America, which is only 4% of the whole world, or maybe 6% of the whole world. And uh, it took from the time of the first century all the way to 1804 to get to one billion. But of course, when you have a billion, things are gonna accelerate. And so we went to two billion in, in 123 years. So in 1927, we had two billion. And, uh, and by now, increments, the increments are right around 11 years. We uh, have a, a billion more. And so now we're just about at 8 billion people. I don't know if you know what a billion is. Let's talk about it real quick here just to give you a perspective. Because God's got plans for everybody. Everybody. Amen. So a million, a, thou, a hundred thousand is one-tenth of a million. And ten hundred thousands is a million. And a million used to be a lot. Right now, it's not all that much. Some people, somebody said to me the other day, you know, if you had a million dollars, look what you could do. I mean, just go for it. And a uh, million dollars could be gone in a flash. Uh, but a billion is a thousand millions. And that's a lot of people, a thousand million people. And eight billion is eight thousand millions. There's a lot of people in the world and God's got plans for every one. Now God made everybody and every fingerprint is different. Even if they're twins, their fingerprints are different. Their mind is different, their soul is different. Even though they look somewhat identical, everybody is an individual person and God's got plans for everybody. Now, you need to believe that for yourself. God's got plans for you. The smartest thing you could ever do is figure out what is God's plan for me. And of course, your will is in it, so you get to help choose. But uh, don't choose to be a loser. Choose to be a winner. God's got plans for you. And, uh, and he says throughout his word, he makes promises to us. And he even said one time, I have plans for you. That you're going to prosper. That you're going to be blessed. That you're going to do good. James, the book of James says that every good and perfect gift comes from God above. Where he is the father of lights and there is no variable nor shadow of turning. And when you study that out, you find out that the lights are talking about the solar system. Uh, and the, the shadow of turning is talking about the earth turning and the going around the sun. Basically what he's saying is God is, is 12 o'clock high shining straight down on you all the time. There's no variableness nor shadow of turning. There's no time when God's not present in your life. God is on the job 24-7, 365 and a quarter. So we serve an awesome God, and he's got plans for you. So the problem is not, if there's a problem, it's not God's plan. The problem is, are we ready for God's plan? Because God is way ahead of us. He's ready any time we are to move forward. But I'm sure it's really neat that God is holy and patient because he needs to be patient with us because we're not always ready to move. We kind of get complacent. We kind of get stuck. 
we, we lose sight, we lose hope, we lose direction. We take a step or two forward and 10 steps back. Uh, and thank God he's holy and patient and loving because we really need it. But throughout history, as you study the Bible, you find out that God's always had a plan. He has a plan. It's really good to know his plan. And uh, sometimes the plan was just to replenish the earth. Sometimes the plan was to build. Sometimes the plan, you know, was to was a promise. Uh, he gave a law. In our day, we just read the plan here when the day of Pentecost was fully come. And nobody before that time could get to this because this was the moment of fruition. This was the moment when it, it finally got here. Some of the people during the last book of the Old Testament and the first book of, of the New Testament, which talks about the coming of the Lord and his birth and, and all of the people that lived there. Anna and Simeon were obviously not 400 years old, the span between the two testaments, but they were up in years now and waiting for the Messiah to show up. And uh, they were looking forward to it. And uh, so the Bible many times says in the due process of time, in the fullness of time. And in this case, it says when the day of Pentecost was fully come. This day was more important than all of those days back there in the Old Testament that it represented. For example, when they came out of Egypt, they celebrated uh, the victory. But God had a plan for them to be delivered. And it ended up being partly spiritual. So they were to kill a lamb. And it had to be a perfect lamb. And there was all kinds of instructions on what to do. And then they were to take the blood and put it on the doorpost of the house. They were to eat that lamb. They were to wait till God did his work and softened up Pharaoh's heart. He finally said, get out of here. You guys are, are free. Go. And uh, so they hit the road. And uh, this was, this was a, an amazing thing. The question is, are you ready? Are you ready for God's plan? Now, they had ended up in Egypt. They lived, lived in the land of Goshen, which was the best part of the country. And, uh, but they ended up losing their heritage somewhat. And uh, they, they ended up in bondage because of their own doing. God's got plans that are good, but a lot of times what we do cause us to be in bondage. For example, you charge up a bunch of charge cards and buy a bunch of stuff you can't afford, you're in bondage. You can't blame that on God. And, uh, and so many times we're asking God to please help us, and basically what you need to say is, God, I need to repent of wrongdoing, and would you please have mercy on me and help me to get rid of, of this bad habit and this debt. So they spent 430 years in Egypt trying to get ready for Abraham's promise, who was their ancestor hundreds of years before. God promised Abraham, wherever you walk, that land belongs to you. But because of their indiscretions, they, they lost the progress and they backslid. And so now here they are in Egypt and they're bringing up their children and generations are being born. And they're, they're not doing too good in serving God and their slaves. But God's got a plan. He's got a deliverer and the deliverer comes and, and the next thing you know, it's time to, to move. It's time to go. And are you ready to go? Well, by the time they had spent that many years in Egypt, they had two problems. One is that, that the mentality they had in their heart and mind was slavery. They had only heard about how they used to be a nation. They had only heard about what God had done for them. They hadn't experienced it. And yet God sent a deliverer and the time had come. Uh, Moses had spent 40 years in the palace, and now he's ready to bring them out of Egypt. It is not the will of God for them to go into the wilderness and waste 40 years 
doubting. How many are with me? I'm talking about our life. Not the will of God for them to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. I mean, the wilderness is a wilderness. I mean, it might be pretty on a postcard to look at the desert in bloom or whatever, but, you know, visit it for a little bit, but you don't want to live there. It's a miserable place. It's hot. There's no water. There's not much vegetation. The animals are, are all hostile. And you're traveling around with your family and all of your friends and relatives, the whole nation, and they are just, they are just having a rough time. Uh, some of them started looking back and saying, well, at least we had a roof over our head. At least we had some food to eat and we're missing some of the stuff they had in Egypt. And, you know, we, we were missing some onions. I miss onions if we don't have them. I like onions. But uh, they just started looking back and murmuring and complaining. They're in the desert. They're in the wilderness. Uh, the Lord could have taken them across there. Now think about this. It's true. They could have taken them across there in one day. But they were not ready. Are you ready? Are you ready for God's miracle in your life? Are you ready for God's plan in your life? Are you ready for God's deliverance? Are you ready for, for what God wants to do in your life in a ministry? What, what are you thinking about? Is the devil setting the pace for where you go? Is the world speaking into your ear and got you going after the things they go after? Or are you interested in the plan of God? God's got a plan. I'm sure he's dying to give it to him. Well, not yet, but he ended up doing it. He really wanted them to have the plan, but they got 40 years to wander around because of doubt and unbelief. And God did great things for them in the desert. Their shoes lasted 40 years. He gave them water out of a rock. He gave them manna to eat. He sent them birds, quail. He, he, he took care of them. But the issue was, is even though God's in there and he's taking care of us, we're not ready for what God's got. God's got something great in your life, but you got to wake up and say, I'm hungry for the plan of God more than anything else. Yes, you're going to live your life. Yes, you're going to do whatever things happen in life. But God's got a plan and we got to be ready for it. So it took them 40 years to get to Canaan land. Now think about this. When they left Egypt, it was three and a half miles to Canaan land. Uh, through Baldwin Park into West Covina is probably three and a half miles. Not even far into West Covina. I mean, you're just jumping on the 10 and going down a few exits and you've gone three and a half miles. And they had three million people. Now that's like this city right over here, Los Angeles. Four million, but I mean, you know, think about all of the millions of people. They, their, their width would take three and a half miles just to pitch tents. And they couldn't make the trip. Not because of the physical limitations, not because God wasn't ready. They weren't ready to take Canaan land. The spies went into Canaan land and, and 12 of them went, 10 of them came back with an evil report. That word evil really means a lot in the Bible. It's not just bad, it's evil. The devil's in there somewhere. <laughs> it's bad news, an evil report. Don't believe an evil report. Rebuke an evil report. God's got a plan for you. You got to rebuke the evil report. The 10 spies came back. Now, mind you, this is Abraham's hike way before that God promised. In Hebrews 11, it says Abraham was called into a place that he would after receive our inheritance and obeyed and went out not knowing whither he went. And he sojourned in a land of promise with his sons who were heirs of the promise together with him 
and his wife, wherever they walked, that land was theirs. And that was what God gave them as Canaan land. So God's taken them to a promised land. Going to be awesome, flowing with milk and honey. And yet, the ten spies said, we can't do it. There will always be obstacles in what you see as the plan of God. But for every giant, there's a giant killer. For every obstacle, there's a God that will gift you through it. And if it's his purpose and his plan, then claim it in Jesus' name. I, my message tonight is don't waste time. Don't waste time getting to the plan. Don't waste time finding out what God wants. It's really easy to find out. His plan, His will for you is not a secret. He's not playing games with it. He's not trying to hide it. It's clear as day what God wants to do. People ask me in church, what can I do? What should I do? A lot of times they're looking at the platform. They want a microphone or whatever. Most of the time I say teach a Bible study. There's probably nothing better that you could do when you get in eternity. When I get to eternity, the time that I spent holding a microphone is probably not going to be much of any credit whatsoever. There's not a category of, you know, you held a mic, and so that really made you somebody. No. But if you want a soul, it's going to be an eternal star in your crown. That's not just any star. That's something God made special. And so, if you wanted to do something for God, teach a Bible study. Win a soul. Spend your influence and effort doing something to help somebody. God blesses people who are willing to give and give what they have. But they weren't ready for the plan of God. They wasted 40 years and they wasted their lives. And all the people over 20 died. And so only Joshua and Caleb were over 20 and the rest of them died. And everybody that went to Canaan land was 20 years old and younger. So don't let anybody despise your youth. Everybody said amen. amen. They get to Canaan land and the first city to conquer is Jericho. Jericho is probably the greatest city. Jericho is a walled city and it has walls that are 30 feet high and 30 feet thick. So as I tell you often, that top beam in the middle is 28 feet high. I know it looks higher than that, but it's 28 feet. I measured it. So two feet higher than that is the height of the wall. And 30 feet wide, that high, that wide. So the chariots drove on the wall. People lived in the wall. Rahab the harlot lived in the wall. And a 30-foot wall, high, high wall is not something that you're going to just jump over. So the Lord gave them instructions. And if you want to think about numbers, think about this. They walked around their promise for seven days. And then God did a miracle. Because they were willing to obey. Everybody was on board. There weren't any protesters saying, we don't like this. They all did whatever they were supposed to do. When it, I mean, they walked quiet. And then it came time for them to blow the trumpet and shout the shout of victory. And they conquered Jericho. In the midst of the victory was a guy who disobeyed the word of God. And... That's a, that's a shame. Achan took some garments out of Jericho. And he took some gold. He hid them under his tent. Caused a lot of trouble for himself, his family, everybody that was related to him. And all the people that lost their lives over his disobedience. So, seven days they walked around to get their victory. Jumping over to the, the day of Pentecost, let's do the math. This is just good history for you to know. But, but uh, when they came out of Egypt, uh, that day was the day of deliverance. And they celebrated that every year. 
And then 50 days later, they would re-celebrate it. It's kind of like when you get something exciting, you know, let's say you have a baby and it's a month old and you, you can't wait for a year to have a party, you know, it's a month old, you want to have a birthday party at one month old. And every other thing that you want to celebrate. You're excited, you want to celebrate it. Well, they were so thrilled to be delivered that 50 days later they had a feast. That's what Pentecost means. Penta is 50 and cost is feast. And so on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the deliverance, they celebrated. And so the Lord had a plan for that day. That's why in the book of Acts he said, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come. So... The day, the day of the Passover is when Jesus was crucified. He was in the grave for three days. And then he was on the earth, seen of everybody, and talked to after he rose again for 40 days. So now we're at 43, right? 40 and 3. And then, how many more days is it to get to 50? Seven same amount of days it took him to march around Jericho to get their promise. And he said, go to Jerusalem and tarry until you be endued with power from on high. And they went to Jerusalem and they didn't know what they were waiting for. They didn't know what it looked like. They didn't know what it felt like, but they obeyed God and they went to Jerusalem. They rented a, a room big enough for 120 people and they all went in there and they prayed. And they were praying for their promise. Now think with me about all the other people in the picture that didn't make it to the upper room because they weren't ready for this promise. They're outside. Maybe they didn't even make it to the vicinity. They didn't obey what Jesus said to do. And so they weren't ready. A whole bunch of people outside got in on the promise when they were curious and God had a plan for them and 3,000 more people received the Holy Ghost. But for the people that prayed for seven days, they got the most important thing that anybody could get. They were born again. Born again. They got the Holy Ghost. Getting the Holy Ghost is the most important thing you could do in your whole life. There's a lot of things you, you need. There's a lot of things that are important. There's a lot of things that are exciting. But there's nothing more important, even more exciting, than the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is God inside of you. And God's giving you a ticket for eternity. If you die, you die in faith. If you live, you're going to hear the trumpet. When you get the Holy Ghost, you are set to be a part of the bride of Christ forever. That's the plan of God for you. I could talk all night about some of the other plans and maybe we'll get to it later. But right now I'm just telling you, don't let anything cheat you out of, out of being ready for the promise God's got. The current promise on the horizon, because there's been others, the current promise on the horizon is the Lord is coming back for his bride. And so some people are not ready for that. They're busy with some other things. They're preoccupied. They, they have convinced themselves that the giants are too big and they can't really do this. This takes faith to do. None of us are good enough to do it. None of us deserve it. None of us can do enough to earn it. It takes faith to believe that God wants to save me. God has promises for me. God has plans for me. God didn't make hell for people. If you go there, you got to get past God and all of his love and all of his goodness to get there. And so don't go there. Yield to God. Cooperate with God. If you just cooperate with a... I mean, faith is a good word for cooperation. He said, if you just cooperate a little bit, your faith can move a mountain. But don't let the devil cheat you out of this plan. You see, 
He don't want you to have this plan. God's got this plan for you. He pronounces good things for you. People have pronounced things in my life all my life. And while I wait, and while I even wonder, in the back of my mind, I have this sense of destiny that, you know what, that's probably going to come true. From early age, with my mom just comforting me as a child, God's hand is on you. You're going to make it. God's going to do things in your life. She had no real clue, but she was making prophetic statements just as a person firsthand in my life. Other people pronounce judgment. Other people pronounce failure. But every time I would hear somebody say something that was a positive, good thing, miracles have been done, God's grandma said it. Several things happened in my early youth to the point where my grandma just cried and cried. And the Lord said, stop crying. My eyes are upon him. Comforted her to let her know that this firstborn grandson's going to be okay. God's got a plan. Even though God's got a plan for me, there's something I got to do. I can't just sit back and get lazy. God's got a plan. You got to find out that plan. You got to seek that plan. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. And so... People like Brother Winslow come here and they speak into your life and you're all excited about what they had to say. And, and there's a lot of feelings about this, you know, this was me, it was spoken openly and wow, that's really great. And then people forget it or they don't really know how to let it unfold. And some people get frustrated if it doesn't happen. And there's a whole lot of people that didn't make it to the day of Pentecost. I'm not sure how many were there when Jesus ascended into heaven, but the angels said, you men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing? This same Jesus who went up to heaven is coming back in like manner as you have seen him go. But you, you're supposed to go to Jerusalem and tarry for the Holy Ghost. They didn't know if it would be a day, a week, a month, a year. They didn't know. They just went in obedience. Seven days later, they got the best thing that could ever happen to you. So, Brother Winslow speaks into your life, and it's miraculous, it's unbelievable, it's past anything you imagined, and, and, it's, and it's unique, and it's different, and you're excited. Well, you need to hold on to that, and if it's the purpose of God, have faith in it, because it's going to happen. Don't worry about what happens in the meantime, but don't let the devil cheat you out of it. Because God has pronounced something. He has pronounced something on all of us. We're his children. Whether you got called out or not. I mean, Brother Winslow came here for many years and never called me out. I, I didn't have the audacity or the nerve to even ask him. But I'd be the guy that hired him to come and put him in the pulpit and he would have a lot of things to say to a lot of people and in the back of my mind I'm thinking, you know, I wonder if he's ever going to say something to me. Because that's kind of how we all are. But you know, God's talking to you right now. And God's talking to you in a dream. God's talking to you in your imagination. God's speaking things into your life and so grab it. He's got miracles for you. He's got plans for you. And we're carnal, so we're thinking, oh, am I going to win the lottery? Am I going to get money? You know, we, we think about carnal things. God's got things way past what this world has to offer. So we need to be excited about what God's got planned. And don't waste time getting there. They spent 40 years getting there. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, there was 120 people ready on the starting line, ready to go. It wasn't like, could we all get together now and could we all hold hands and could we all believe and, you know, could we cast out every doubt and could, you know, could we focus here? No, they were all in one place, one accord, one mind. They had obeyed, they had prayed, they had sought God. 
They didn't even need to know what it was. God was going to do it. It's a gift and a promise from God. God's got promises for you. Every time you put money in the offering, every time you honor God with what you have, he says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to curse the devourer. I'm going to give you wisdom. Things are going to go good. I'm going to make you the loner, not the borrower. I'm going to make you the head, not the tail. He said, if any deadly thing comes inside of you, he's going to rebuke it. You, you're going to have power to heal the sick and raise the dead. And, and you're going to cast out devils in his name. And some people can't imagine doing that. They can't think of, how could I ever do that? And they, they may never get to it. But these are promises God gave you. For you. When you pray for your family, have faith in your prayer because faith is what moves God. God's got miracles and promises and, and prophecies. And you can't even imagine what God's going to do in your life. I mean, God says we're going to sit in the seat with him at the white throne judgment and judge the world you don't think much of yourselves and you shouldn't in your own carnality but you got to understand God's got some pretty big plans for you we're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years during the, during the millennium and then who knows what we're going to do in eternity we're not going to be sitting around taking a nap we're going to have a glorified body there's going to be one eternal day. There's not going to be any night. And we're going to take on any task God gives us. And I don't want to miss it for nothing. I'm excited about God's plan. I don't want to waste time getting to God's plan. Now, God gave Joseph a dream and it was a long time till it happened and a whole lot of things in the middle happened but he focused on what God promised him he didn't lose heart and God developed his character and got him ready and worked him right into what God said was going to happen in our carnality we're not quite ready for ruling the world we're not quite quite ready for judging the world but it's in our destiny and it's in God's plan for you so grab it the Bible said the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it we're not talking about physical violence we're talking about spiritual warfare one puts a thousand to flight two puts a thousand ten thousand to flight when you make up your mind you're going to defeat the enemy in a spiritual warfare there's a lot of weapons and we do it with all of our heart and the devils tremble. So the violent take it. Everybody say take it. There is a place where you hold the door open for a lady. I raced today to the door and there was a, a man headed there and I just stepped a little faster. <laughs> I don't know what he thought was happening, but I opened the door and went like that, and he was like in shock. <laughs> I was like, oh, thank you. Wasn't expecting that. We're we're ready to walk through the door, aren't we? We're we're a different breed. We're a peculiar people. We are not just the rest of the people out there in the world. We have a destiny. God's got something planned for us. For everybody has got a different plan. But your plan is just as exciting as my plan. And every plan comes with the grace of God to do what you're supposed to do. Everybody said amen. amen. So ten spies had an evil report. Two guys were right. And they had to keep a good attitude for 40 years. And then those are the two, only two guys that made it to 40 years. I want God's plan. All right, so we have a whole lot of time left. According to the plan. 
So maybe you have a question or a subject you'd like to talk about. I've been thinking of doing this for several weeks, but I had messages, and I thought we'll take a few moments tonight if, if there's a subject that you would like to talk about. A Bible question. All right. Everybody's drawing a blank. Yes. What's the most effective way of dealing with anger? Good question. So what is anger anyway? Anger is when something happens and you don't have the power to do something about it. And so you get angry. And if you could do something, that would be the thing to do, is do it. But anger is something got out of your control, something got past you, something made you upset because you can't deal with it. And so, back to what we've already said tonight, the Holy Ghost gives you grace to deal with anger. If you have the Holy Ghost, the Bible says, be angry and sin not. Anger is not bad. Anger is an emotion. And when something happens bad, people get upset. But do something with that drive. Don't just let it fizzle out. If you just let it fizzle out, it's a dud. But, you know, if you're upset because you failed then get up and try again and let that anger be your drive. But anger is just a, an emotional feeling of something that got out of your control and you can't, can't control it so you got upset about it. And uh, the rot of anger fails because when you plant anger in a picture, it breeds and causes anger. You ever seen somebody in another car and they just, they just in a rage at you, road rage. And, and it's a temptation to give it back. I mean, I, I got the Holy Ghost, but if somebody's raging at me, I'm looking, I'm like, you know, my flesh wants to come back at it for whatever reason it is, but that's just not what my life is about. And so even though it's not my nature, I run from that because that could go wrong bad. People have killed one another and they don't even know what they're angry about. So don't give place to it. The Bible says when anger's in the picture, a soft answer turns away wrath. So what do you want? I want peace. So I'm going to bite my tongue when I could answer anger, but it's not going to turn out good for me or anybody else. I had a guy on the job years ago who used to tell me he didn't like me. He didn't like me because I was a Christian and probably he felt convicted or whatever. I didn't preach to him or mess with him, but... Every day he'd get drunk and come back from lunch and want to fight me. And uh, he would tell me, you know, if you, if you make me mad, if you make me mad, I mean, there is no telling what I'm going to do if you make me mad. And, uh, and I'm just honorary enough to look there and just kind of smile at him like, you know, I didn't taunt him too much, but I would just kind of smile like... Yeah, right. The manager came to me and said, we need to fire this guy and we need you to file your complaint. I said, if you want to fire him, you fire him. I'm not filing any complaint. <laughs> so don't give yourself to anger. Don't go there. Another question. Wow. Everybody's just filled up. All right, Sister Lita.
Okay, that's a good question. So there's two kinds of speaking in tongues. One is for personal edification. When you get the Holy Ghost, it's your mouth, your tongue, your experience. Nobody can cheat you out of that. But nobody has that for themselves. That's your experience. So that adds to your faith. And that's why faith becomes strong because God's speaking through you and you know it's God. Okay, so that happened in the book of Acts. There's five times in the book of Acts where speaking in tongues was used as an evidence of the Holy Ghost. Acts 2, 4, 8, 10, and 19. They heard that they, in Acts 10, for example, example, Peter was a Jew. These were Italians, Cornelius' house. Peter did not believe the Italians could get the Holy Ghost. He was against it. So, the Lord showed him a vision of unclean animals on the rooftop, and the Lord said, eat it, and he said, no, I don't eat this. Right at that same time, Cornelius was knocking at his door. He went down to answer it, and Cornelius said, an angel told me to talk to you. You're going to tell me what to do to be saved. Peter's kind of putting two to two together, but he still don't like the idea that these are not Jews. So then he told them about he told them about Acts 238 and they got the Holy Ghost and the Bible says for they heard them speak with other tongues. Acts 10:44 and then so from there on it says so so since they've received the Holy Ghost as well as we then we need he commanded them to be baptized. So the evidence of the Holy Ghost is speaking in tongues. When you speak in tongues, you don't understand what you're saying. It's another tongue. It could be uh, a language of this earth, which many times it has been, maybe as a testimony to somebody listening. We had a Jewish girl at the altar, or no, she wasn't a Jewish girl. She was a little girl, seven years old, getting the Holy Ghost, and a Jewish man standing in the altar listening to her talk, and she was talking to him and telling him that Jesus was God. And so when she got done, he wanted to go talk to her in Hebrew because he heard her speaking in his language. And she's just a little girl. She didn't, he wanted to know if the family knew Hebrew and, and everybody was drawing a blank. And he literally got a firsthand experience from God and speaking in tongues when somebody got the Holy Ghost. That doesn't always happen, but you don't know what you're saying. I've heard missionaries on the foreign field say that in, in that field where everybody speaks that language, they hear somebody out in the crowd speaking English. And they make their way out there to sort of hang around and see if that person knows English because they know that's probably somebody getting the Holy Ghost and they're speaking in a different tongue than what they know. So... Who? Sister Judy. Oh, really? Yes. Remember Sister Judy? And she don't know in Spanish, so... There's a, there's a first-hand example. So the question is, the question is, is does there need to be an interpretation? So remember I told you the divisions in the book of Acts. We're talking about being born again, and the sign of that is speaking in another tongue. He quoted Joel 2.28 and Isaiah 28.11, which says, In the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your young men shall dream dreams, your old men shall see visions, and on upon my uh, head manes will I pour out my spirit, and they will speak with stammering lips and another tongue. That's the prophecy in the Old Testament of the New Testament receiving the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. So when you get the Holy Ghost, you speak in tongues. People in the world don't like for us to tell them they don't have the Holy Ghost. Because like in the Catholic Church, they were instructed that when they, they got their 12-year-old confirmation that they received the Holy Ghost. I taught a Bible study to a Catholic school teacher uh, and her, and her, her husband and, and uh, family. And uh, she told me, you know, I don't mind you teaching me a Bible study, but all I'm going to tell you is don't tell me I don't have the Holy Ghost. I said, okay, I won't tell you that. I was probably 25 years old. 
And so one day I showed up to the house and she greeted me at the front door with, with unbelievable excitement, zeal. She literally picked me up. She picked me up, hugging me. How come you didn't tell me that I didn't have the Holy Ghost? I said, you told me not to. She said, I got the Holy Ghost. I was praying and I got the Holy Ghost. I spoke in tongues. So even though she didn't believe in it, she was sincere and hungry before God and she got the Holy Ghost. So tongues is the evidence. God may use it as a testimony to somebody. It's certainly a testimony to you. But then from Romans to Jude are letters written to the churches from the apostles telling them how to live and worship. So in Corinthians, he gives instructions about speaking in tongues in church. And there's gifts that are in the, in the church. And one of the gifts is the gift of tongues. So this gift of tongues is different than receiving the Holy Ghost. You will have received the Holy Ghost if you have the gift of tongues. This gift is intentionally intended to be interpreted. So somebody that has the gift of tongues is going to speak out in service. And then we're going to get quiet if we feel like it's God. See, it's kind of hard to dif differentiate sometimes because people are speaking in tongues. And sometimes people speak in tongues loud. And you, you think we just kind of go right on and, we, you know, you think, well, what happened there? Well, that might not have been a tongues for the congregation. It might have just been somebody praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, let's back up for a second or actually go forward in this, in Corinthians, in that chapter, the, Paul said, it's better to speak five words in your known language than 10,000 words in another tongue when you're trying to impart knowledge. So he said, I'm not going to get up here and speak in tongues for an hour and let you sit there and wonder what I'm saying. I'm going to tell, talk to you in your language. But then he went on to say, but I speak in tongues more than you all. So he wasn't knocking speaking in tongues. He was just saying there's a place for it. And, and there, it has a purpose. So the gift of tongues is to be interpreted. When somebody speaks in tongues and we feel that it's the gift of tongues operating, we'll just kind of quiet the service and then that person or some other person will give an interpretation. And some people here have told me, as, long, as well as myself, is when that person spoke in tongues, I felt an impression in the Holy Ghost. Some people have come to me and say, Brother Cooley, I don't know what to think, but I really felt a strong impression. Well, it takes a little bit of, just like when you get the Holy Ghost, it takes a little faith to step out and say what you're feeling. And then people start talking about, you know, so there's a gift of tongues. There's a gift of interpretation of tongues. These are two gifts. These are visible gifts that you see. So Paul said these are the least of the gifts. Some gifts are in operation and you don't even know it. The gifts are not for us to be glorified about. We don't put a sign on our back and say I'm, the light's on, you know, the blue light special's on or the red light's on. And so now I'm operating the gift of tongues or now I'm operating the gift of love or I'm operating the gift of, of whatever. You know, we don't do that. The Bible, he went on to say all of these gifts are operated by the Holy Ghost when the Holy Ghost wants to operate them. So we don't just operate it at will. I've, I've operated the gift of healing. I prayed for people and they were healed instantly. I prayed for people and they died. <laughs> they were healed instantly too. But sometimes I prayed for people and nothing happened. So I don't own it. It's a gift operated by the Holy Ghost. So tongues is a gift and interpreting the tongues is a gift. Now, I don't think the person interpreting the tongues is trying to understand that language and interpret it. They're just receiving in the Holy Ghost the interpretation of the tongues. The next question becomes, you know, when somebody speaks as the interpreter, what are the criteria for them to, to speak? Are they going to say, behold, thus saith the Lord? Or are they going to say, my people, they're going to speak in the first hand, or are they going to speak in the second hand? 
are they going to speak the king's English or are they going to talk like they're ignorant from the south? Well, some people in the south are ignorant. <laughs> At least that's the way we used to say it. You know, some, some people are not very well educated. And here's the rule of thumb. Might surprise you, but... But whatever level of your ability and education is what's going to come through. The message is going to be there. But you might butcher English. You might not say everything correct. And then people have criticized it. Well, that can't be God. They say it ain't. They said this and that and the other. It could be God. It could be God. A, a bum on the side of the road that needs a bath could be an angel in disguise. An angel doesn't mean he's just from heaven, angelic. It means that he was sent as your angel unaware. So tongues in the, in the letters written to churches telling them what to do are, are for the body. And then he gave rules because in the, in, in the church in Corinth, they got out of line. And the next thing you know, everybody is wanting to speak in tongues and interpret. So he said, there can only be three in a service, and that by course. There's going to be tongues, there's going to be interpretation. There's going to be tongues, there's going to be interpretation. Three, no more. So if a fourth one shows up, one of those other three were no good. <laughs> or the fourth one is not right. And we don't make a practice to judge it, but... Um, so yeah, tongues in the book of Acts is receiving the Holy Ghost. That's the evidence. Tongues in the, in the, in the book of Corinthians is about operation of the gifts in the church. The gifts of the Spirit are for the body. For edification, exhortation, and comfort for the body. So... There, you know, when I was a kid and, and uh, somebody would stand up and begin to speak in tongues, I would hide underneath the bench. I thought for sure that they were going to say, behold, thus saith the Lord. I mean, I, I wasn't any big rank sinner or nothing, but I just figured God's going to call me out right here. Behold, Jonathan Cooperly, and so I would hide under the bench. <laughs> Until I heard the teaching that said, it's not going to be a rebuke to a person. It's not going to be something that is negative like that. It's going to be an edification, an exhortation, or a comfort. So now I can sit up in church and keep my head up and not have to worry. I don't see any marriage class, so maybe we could take one more question. All right. Okay, so that's a subject in the Bible. When Paul's giving the gifts, there are nine gifts. And he said, seek these gifts. Ask God for these gifts. But ask for the best gifts. Okay, so being nine gifts, there are three categories. And three of them are very visible. Tongues, interpretation of tongues. And I think... Maybe the gift of prophecy, I forget. Anyway, three of them are very visible, and he calls those the least of all the gifts because they exalt the flesh the most. You're pretty much, you know, not going to hide if you start speaking in tongues as a gift of tongues. Not going to be like, who knows what's going on? Everybody knows. So that's the least of the gifts. Some of the gifts are in operation, and nobody even knows. There's the gift of faith, there's the gift of the word of wisdom, there's a gift of the word of knowledge, there's tongues, interpretation of tongues, there, there's nine gifts, but some of the gifts, he said, are the best gifts. So, uh, there's nothing wrong with asking God to use you in the gifts, but don't think it's for your glory. And don't think you're in charge of it. Don't think you get to do it whenever you want to. And that's the problem we have in churches if people haven't been taught. You know, they take off trying to take over and speak for God and usurp the pulpit. And in churches like ours where we're educated about what the Bible says, we're, we're liable to just say, sit down. We, we know what the Bible says. We know that you're, you're as a person in church, you are never going to usurp that pulpit. 
You're never going to speak for God and interrupt or take over a service because you're supposedly being spiritual. The whole mid-1800s was operated with churches like this. And some churches do, did tongues and interpretation and literally ran the whole town. Told people who to marry. Told who to get out of town. Who to, who to, what house to buy in tongues and interpretation. In fact, in 1853, they had us in, in mid-America. They had uh, a, a couple of sisters called the Fox Sisters, and they literally ran the whole town through tongues and interpretation. So all of that is carnal. All of that is misuse of the gifts. The Bible says the gifts are operated by the Holy Ghost for whenever God wants to operate it. So if God wants to speak to us, if God wants to operate... It very well could be that this is an operation of the word of wisdom or the word of knowledge. But I don't claim it and I don't know it. And if it's happening, it's up to God. And it's not for us. It's not our glory. It's, it belongs to God. So that's a good question. Which are the best gifts? The, the best gifts are the least visible, the least to make attention to yourself. All right, let's stand together. I want what God's got for me. And he's got plans. He's got awesome plans. God does very grand things. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap right now. He's worthy to be praised. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. God bless you tonight. Greet one another. Amen. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.